So I'm going to discuss bioabsorbable scaffolds. Is it the next big thing? So let's see. You know, this is a picture that I got from BBC. It's a tunnel that they're building uh, their undergrounds. And usually us interventionalists, we like to, you know, play and just kind of create a lumen. But really there's more than the lumen. There's the wall. If this wall collapses, it's a danger to the people riding the underground in London. But it's also, uh, if the wall, if something happens to the wall uh, of the vessel and it reoccludes, if you don't prevent neoatherosclerosis, then you really haven't achieved your target. And this is where bioabsorbable scaffolds come in. So if we compare, this is an OCT of a metallic drug eluting stent and absorb, uh, bioabsorbable stent. Uh, essentially, if you look at the one on the left-hand side, well, yeah, it's your left-hand side. This is the metallic stent. After five years, you can still see the stent struts. And after five years, you look at the bioabsorbable uh, scaffold and there is no struts and you maintain the integrity of the vessel. At least this is what everybody is discussing in the trials. So the hypothesis, I don't know how many of you actually watched this movie. Now you see me, uh, now you don't. It's really about uh, magicians. And is it magic that we have, we put a stent in a patient's vessel and it no longer exists after five years according to that prior trial. So the hypothesis is why, why do we even want to make sure that it, it's absorbed and it no longer remains in the vessel? One, it retains endothelial function and integrity. Is this what these uh, stents going to allow us? Number two, is it going to permit future cabbage? So if you put it in a location that permits the uh, surgeons later on to come in if the patient uh, continues to have atherogenesis. And the other thing is none of us are comfortable with fractured or unopposed struts that we diagnose by IBIS. We try to uh, tack it up, we try to clean it up. But if we don't, or now cardiac CT has picked up, you know, gaps between stents, uh, uh, malopposed stents and so on, that haven't really translated into a clinical event but have been picked up by the technology. None of us are comfortable leaving it. But if you have a bioabsorbable scaffold, it's not left over there and there's nothing for you to worry about. You know, will you prolong your dual antiplatelet therapy or not? So cl clinical decisions will be made based on these subtle technicalities. So that's the hypothesis. But all these hypotheses are, you know, what we call wishful thinking. But ultimately, it's really this. This is what ultimately it means. The rate of drug elution and polymer absorption, will it affect clinical outcomes in these biodegradable polymer-based drug eluting stents or not? You know, if it doesn't translate into clinical events, why should I take a more expensive uh, stent, a stent that is more difficult to deploy, uh, you know, you need a lot of pre-preparation uh, of this, the vessel before you deploy it. Uh, so I think this is what I'm going to try to go over um, in the next few minutes. But one more thing before I proceed is, now you see me, now you don't. What is it that you don't actually see? Is it the polymer, is it the drug, or is it the struts? Well, the technology has evolved where they've actually addressed all of these. So I'm going to go over the absorb trials because this covers the, uh, the main scaffold that everybody is talking about, but there are other, other stents that have been uh, in the limelight uh, lately. So I'll go over the Biosolve Bio 2 sti uh, study, the Panda 3 Evolve trials, and so on, just so I've covered all kinds of stents. So I'll start with the first one, the Absorb BVS. It's basically an Everolimus stent that's covered by PDLLA. The polymer itself is only seven microns, but the stent or the stent struts thickness is actually 150 microns. So it's actually pretty thick. Um, and it's uh, got uh, poly uh, uh, platinum markers that we can see. It's very difficult to see angiographically once deployed, actually. Now the first trial was the, uh, you know, there's the Absorb 1 and Absorb 2. The Absorb 2 was uh, published in Lancet in 2014. Essentially it took two arms, BVS about 300, and the Zions, uh, which is an Everolimus metal stent, uh, about 166, and they compared MACE, major adverse cardiac events in both. It did not translate into any clinical events. But if you actually, um, uh, any statistical significance, the only thing is if you look here, target vessel MI was 4.2%, which was statistically significant. We did not see that in the next trial, which is the Absorb 3. Um, you know, there are many speculations as why that is the case, possibly because we've learned to uh, not cut corners and prepare the vessel better before we deploy these stents. This is the Absorb 3 trial, which was just uh, uh, presented two weeks ago, the TCT, Everolimus Eluting Bioabsorbable Scaffold. Um, essentially what they did is they took about 2,000 patients and they uh, um, randomized them into getting either an, a Zion stent or an Absorb stent and followed them through. The primary endpoint was an, uh, targeted as non-inferiority to compare it for target lesion failure. And the secondary endpoints, angina, target vessel revascularization, and all kinds of revascularization, it was actually uh, aimed to be a superiority study. Um, mind you, the angina was not 
study adjudicated, it was um, site adjudicated, as was the case in um, the absorbed tooth trial. So as I said, they randomized them into two arms and followed up these patients, um, and these are the essential results. So essentially, the primary endpoint was met. There was non the non-inferiority margin was uh, predetermined at 4.5%, and it was met over here with a, with a significant uh, uh, p-value. 1.7 was the difference between them, 7.8 here and 6.1 with science. So if you look at target lesion failure, I'm sorry, sorry this may not be showing up, but in terms of composite endpoints of cardiac death, uh, MI, and target lesion revascularization, again, uh, there was no statistical significant, uh, significantly difference, and so there was no, um, no difference in the two. Now in terms of thrombosis, again, um, there was no statistical significance here. The one, the one stent thrombosis was in a patient who had a prior Zion stent. So in conclusion, if you look at the ABSORB trial, comparing both ABSORB and the Zions, which is now the latest generation uh, stent that we are using, the primary endpoint was met. As I said, at one year, they looked at target lesion failure. Um, if you look at the safety and efficacy endpoints, it was met as well. But they do suggest that long-term follow-up is necessary for these patients. Um, now, this trial didn't actually go into it, but they look at uh, examining these patients with OCT or optical coherence tomography, and it's actually strongly recommended in these patients to make sure you have uh, appropriately treated vessels, well-opposed uh, stents. Now, another thing is, can we be using them? We go to many presentations and meetings and so on. You see people showing off the use of these stents in both bifurcations and in STEMIs. So this was actually ad addressed by Patrick Cerise in Trophy 2, and that was uh, presented at the ESC Congress, where they actually looked at patients who uh, under had a uh, ST elevation MI and randomized them into absorber zines. Interestingly, though, they first achieved re uh, revascularization, so they initially reperfused the vessel. So whether that was with uh, ballooning only or thrombectomy, and then at that point the, the vessel was, the patient was randomized to either a, bi a bioabsorbable scaffold or a metallic stent. They did um, imaging for all these patients, and what they did is they decided on a healing score and gave them a different number. Uh, this is available online um, to look at the number for these patients, but essentially um, they looked at close to 200 patients. As I said, after they achieved uh, TIMI-2 flow in these patients, whether by th uh, thrombus aspiration or predilatation, and then the patients received dual antiplatelet for at least one year. Um, this is again going over the same thing, and looking at the results, um, it actually, the results looked good. They looked at the times, they were comparable, they looked at the, um, there was no, again, the primary endpoint was met with non-inferiority between a bioabsorbable scaffold and a uh, drug eluding stent. And again, they used optical coherence tomography in about 100 of those patients, comparing them, looking at the neo-intimal area and so on, and uh, it seemed to be doing very well, measuring very well compared to a uh, everolimus eluding stent. So in conclusion for this study that was presented, the TROPHY trial, absorbed in the setting of STEMI resulted in nearly complete arterial healing when it was compared to the metallic stents at six months. MALA position and both MALA position with uncovered stents were lower in the absorb arm. Uh, you know, we can elaborate on that and we can make a lot of guesses. Uh, did they prepare the vessel a lot more when they knew they, were, they had made a decision to go ahead with the BVS and so on? Uh, we don't really know. The limitations, as, as I said, one of the most important limitations um, was that after they had achieved TIMI-3 flow, they decided, or, or TIMI-2 flow, they made a decision which direction to go with which stent. And again, these cannot be uh, extrapolated to any other absorbable material. And the sample size was actually too small to make anything meaningful uh, in terms of um, clinical outcomes, hard endpoints. Greg Stone is, uh, has another trial in the making, the Horizons Absorb. Basically, he's hoping to randomize a more powerful trial uh, to randomize about 5,000 patients, either BVS or Zions, and looking at non-inferiority non for target lesion failure at one year, superiority from one to five years. So that was one, one uh, uh, um, category of absorbable uh, agents, and, uh, or of stents, sorry, devices. This is another one, which is actually very interesting, and I'm very excited about this one. It's the Biosolve trial. Essentially, it's a biotronic, it's a magnesium scaffold. So what they're hoping is that this uh, is going to be absorbed over time. By 12 months, the magnesium has already been completely absorbed. And they designed a trial. Granted, it was a small uh, number of patients enrolled in it, but it is promising about 120 or so. Uh, six months follow-up, 12 months follow-up, and then continuous follow-up. But right now, uh, we only have the initial uh, six-month follow-up for these patients. Again, this was just presented two weeks ago at the TCT. Um, if you look at the baseline characteristics, there are 
fairly similar in, in, in all the groups um, of the patients. And they also did IVIS analysis in a subgroup of these patients. They looked at the lumen, they looked at the scaffold area, uh, and looked at any area in between the vessel area, and looked at any area in between uh, which categorized the plaque area, and new intimal hyperplasia. And actually, again, if you look at the numbers post-procedure and at six months, um, they looked very good in these patients that received the biotronic stent. 73% uh, uh, reduction, there was a, the uh, new intimal hyperplasia area was reduced by 73% in these uh, patients. So as I said, OCT was performed in about nine, uh, 30 per, uh, patients only. Um, but again, it, what it did is it looked at the scaffold area at post, immediately post-procedure and then at six months and, it and the incomplete struct apposition um, initially and then at six months and uh, they had excellent results. So this is actually a very promising um, uh, stent. Now, if we look at clinical results in terms of hard endpoints, in terms of death, target vessel revascularization, and so on, again, the results was, were also impressive. But again, let's not forget this was a very small trial. Uh, there was improved in late lumen loss, vasomotion. They had proved it with the different uh, imaging modalities that they used. There was preservation of the scaffold area, uh, and, but no definite or probable scaffold th thrombosis was also detected in these patients. But again, very small number, and that is definitely a limitation, but at least it's a proof of concept. The PANDA trial, again, presented at TCT a couple of weeks ago. It's a uh, bioabsorbable polymer-based metallic stent comparing, uh, being compared here. <coughs> now, the interesting thing here is the polymer is a PLGA, and it has, it's this, the way it's actually um, uh, formed is they, uh, or, or um, they, they have a base layer in between the stent struts and the polymer, and hopefully that helps the elution of the drug. So by 100% one, of the serolimus drug itself is actually uh, eluted at 30 days, and the uh, polymer itself is completely absorbed by three months, as opposed to the standard serolimus stents that we currently use, where we're looking at 180 days, six to nine months before the polymer itself is absorbed. Um, they enrolled actually over 2,000 patients randomized to either the uh, uh, absorbable stent or the XL uh, serolimus stent, and they looked at hard endpoints. The um, baseline characteristics of the patients and the lesions were very similar in both arms, including diabetes and so on. And the procedural information in terms of uh, the predilatation, the length of the uh, lesion and the stent and, and so on were also very uh, uh, comparable. Target lesion failure, um, look at that. It was. was practically overlapping uh, for the duration of the uh, follow-up of these patients, so it's a very promising um, uh, stent that could be used. The most important limitation here, I would say, is that it was not powered adequately to evaluate low-frequency safety endpoints like stent thrombosis. Finally, I'm not going to bore you to death, and I'm going to allow for some time for a discussion at the end, is the Synergy trial, uh, Synergy uh, uh, stents, which are widely used right now and just received FDA uh, approval um, last month. This is an Everolimus eluting platinum chromium stent with absorbable polymer. So we're talking about the polymer here that's being absorbed, not the stent struts. It's very thin. It's about 74 microns only with a four micron uh, polymer. The aim of the polymer is to allow us to deliver the drug and maintain stent in integrity. The polymer is associated with stent thrombosis, that is in all, all stents. And the whole idea of having this being absorbable is you reduce your late stent thrombosis. What's interesting about these synergy, drug, uh, synergy stents is that the um, PLGA is actually only abluminal, which means it helps prevent the proliferation of smooth muscle cells. That's the new atherosclerosis that we're talking about. And the luminal surface essentially functions as a bare metal stent. So what they're suggesting is that this stent gives you the best of two worlds. It gives you the best of a bare metal stent and the best of a drug eluting stent. And again, there was a battery of uh, trials that were uh, performed to um, bring this stent into life, the EVOLVE trial, uh, trials, the first in human, EVOLVE 2, et cetera, uh, EVOLVE China, and EVOLVE DAPT. And what they're looking at here is a wide spectrum of, of uh, patients and a wide spectrum of questions to be answered. Can this be used? Well, one is, uh, you know, to f first in, in man, can it be used or not? Looking at imaging and how that helps it, dual antiplatelet, can it be used in diabetic patients? And, and uh, looking at uh, meta-analyses to look at these diabetic patients, acute coronary syndromes, CTOs, bifurcations, and as I said, uh, multivessel diseases. So we just went over a, a number of bioabsorbable stents, whether we're talking about the scaffold or the, that is being absorbed or the polymer that is being absorbed, but at the end of the day, it is not the traditional stent, it's not a, a bare metal stent, it's not a drug eluting stent. We're not just looking at the lumen that we've created, we're looking at the wall. Um, but 
if you looked at all the trials that I've just bored you with, the one thing is they're non-inferior. So if they're non-inferior to the standard drug eluting stents that we are using today, should we be paying more? Should we be taking a risk more? It is more expensive to put a bioabsorbable stent in a patient irrespective because the stent itself costs more. If you're going to follow the recommended guidelines where you're going to use some intracoronary imaging such as OCT or minimum IVUS, then that's an additional expense. So if you're showing non-inferiority, should we be using these bioabsorbable stents? Uh, because the most we've proven right now is non-inferiority. We certainly have not proven any superiority. The next question that I'm going to ask is, um, you know, aside from looking at expense for these patients, um, looking at technique, have we learned something from these bioabsorbable stents? Have we learned that we've been cutting corners with the drug eluting stents and been, you know, we don't predilate as, as aggressively, we don't do plaque modification as aggressively anymore, and we're learning the lesson with bioabsorbable stents. So have we learned something when they have uh, come to the surface? Uh, so I think, yes, we've seen, we don't see the stent, but we've learned a lot. Um, and I'll leave it here for questions for the whole panel, I suppose.